no matter who you are, where you are, or life's journey, you are welcome here. Jesus said, You are the light of the world. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives off light to all in the house. We light our candles and think about how we are called to be God's light and that we have a purpose. We worship in the name of God, who is creator, Christ, and spirit. We begin our worship using the words of one of the best known psalms, the 23rd, known as the Shepherd Psalm. It reminds us of the nature of God. It reminds us that God provides for our needs. It reminds us that God wants us to not only survive, but be able to experience and enjoy beauty and renewal in life. It reminds us that God will lead us in our decision making. It reminds us that when our lives experience a difficulty, which happens to all of us, God will be an active presence. It closes with the reminder of abundance. And blessing. Let us pray together the words of the psalmist. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down.
I want to begin the message for the day in Armenia. Some of you may have seen a post I put out late yesterday um, about um, acknowledging the fact that um, our president yesterday on Armenian Genocide Day, which is always the 24th of April, um, acknowledged for the first time formally from the U.S. government that a genocide began on April 24th, 1915 in what is now modern-day Turkey, and over a million to a million and a half Armenians were killed. Many nations have acknowledged this genocide. Ours has not, mostly due to politics. Um, the country of modern-day Turkey has been resistant about acknowledging what um, is pretty evident. And because I've lived among the Armenian community, particularly in the country of Turkey, uh, not in the country of Turkey, in, when I was in Beirut, um, I saw just how that genocide continued to play out almost a century later, a century plus, generations later. And it played out as much not just due to the loss of what were ancient homes and homelands, but the loss that came about because of the lack of acknowledgement. So, I'm grateful to a president um, who has acknowledged a genocide because I know how important it is to the living. But I also was going to Armenia anyways today. It wasn't planned. I found, a, maybe because of this, I found myself remembering a trip that I had taken to what is today the country of Armenia when I was um, the spiritual life director at Haigazian University in Beirut. Um, I spent a couple weeks um, in Armenia. I accompanied the president on the, of my university for a couple of events, but most of the time was just personal time. In the middle of my time in Armenia, I rented a car called the Neva. It's an a Russian four-wheel drive vehicle um, that was known for its quirks. <laughs> for five days, I drove around in it and completely surrounded by the smell of gasoline the whole time. But one day, evening, as I was coming up over a mountain ridge, heading down into a village on a nearby lake, I was coming down around sundown and had to slow down. Because what was happening at sundown was all of the shepherds were descending into town with their flocks and their flocks of sheep were mingling together on the road as they each came in from their separate locations and the road was just a wave of sheep and you could see the various shepherds, and you could see how they were coming in with their groups. The sheep were mixing together. Now, I have no idea where they ended up spending the night, which um, sheep folds they gathered into. My hunch is that, for the most part, they re-split out, but that some shepherds combined together. But undoubtedly, what would be happening the next morning um, is that when the shepherds got up to leave, they would simply call out and their sheep would begin to follow and there would be this sort of mass in reverse, all mixed together. But at critical points, you would begin to see flocks spreading out, following the shepherds. The shepherds weren't worried about this mix-up because they knew their sheep and their sheep knew them. Any one of you who goes into um, a place that has sheep 
and the sheep don't know you, knows what happens. They run away. Some of you saw the, the video clip that I shared as part of the message the Sunday after Christmas, where the sheep stood nearby. They cooperated when Janine sang a beautiful piece of music. Well, we bribed those sheep. <laughs> and we had the shepherd standing nearby. So we had two things working for us. Otherwise, I would never have gotten near to one of them. Because shepherd, I mean sheep, just automatically stay away from the stranger and the one that does not belong. Where we're going today is we're going into a passage about sheep. It comes from John's Gospel. And in John's Gospel, one of the beloved images that we use and hear about with Jesus of Nazareth is the phrase of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. I can't speak for you, but I suspect many of you feel the same way that I do about that particular passage and that image. It's a comforting image. Um, the sense of Jesus as being our shepherd. The picture on the front of your bulletins captures a little bit of a sense of, some of us love that sense that maybe we're the lamb that's hanging around his arms, his shoulders, the, the one that he's carrying and he is joyful about. It's an image that makes us feel protected and safe. And that definitely is part of the message that we should be pulling out of this passage that comes out of John's gospel. But John, being the nature of who he is, never makes it easy. Because when you look at the particular story in which this arises out of the 18 verses in John's gospel, you realize that it's coming in a variety of different ways, that it's really a series of stories tied together that becomes one whole story, and the various parts each has a message that it really wants you to walk away from and be reflecting on, and yet we're also meant to look at it as a whole. And it's nowhere near as straightforward um, as that particular image or painting that we have focused in our minds of the Good Shepherd. The other piece we always have to do with this is we need to separate out a couple other passages. We need to separate out the parable of the lost sheep because Jesus isn't talking about it. And yet, it kind of sneaks its voice in, doesn't it? You can't not let that sense of the shepherd going and seeking out the lost and, and celebrating as not being part of the good shepherd, even though it's not part of John's gospel. And there are one or two other passages, um, and yet we look at this and we see the metaphor, we, we see that sense that Jesus, the good shepherd, some of you may have read my pastor's pen on, on Friday, where I talk about metaphors in John's gospel. There is a second metaphor in this passage for, for the nature of Jesus, the nature of God, that I don't reference in it. I guess I really wasn't thinking about it until I tried to memorize this passage. You're going to see me shift around because I didn't do a good job of memorizing And that's where Jesus is called the gate, another metaphor. Um, I want to be careful with that particular metaphor of Jesus as the gate because um, there are people who like to run literalistic. And then almost immediately they begin to try to think, well, what kind of gate? And I know some Christians would end up with a kind of gate as being the same kind we run into at um, airports when we basically have to strip down and, and um, almost get a total search of our belongings and our beings before we're allowed to pass through. 
um, I seriously doubt that's what Jesus is thinking of with a gate, because I've been in the Middle East. I've seen the kinds of gates that go on sheep pens. They're kind of flimsy. And anyone who is listening to Jesus talking, hearing his stories, as soon as you mention it, a sheep's gate would not be going to thinking about something that's exclusive and high security, but really would be looking at something that's kind of flimsy because one of the realities of sheep is they like each other. They want to be together. They don't mind being shoulder to shoulder. And so when they get into the sheepfold together, if they, particularly if it's evening time and time for rest, they're happy to stay in that place. They're not trying to get out. And so one needs to think more of a more open-ended. The other piece I find myself thinking about and wanting to remind as a connection on is as I had that image coming over the mountains in Armenia and approaching that village and all these sheep coming in to town because the shepherds were going to be spending the night in their homes, it was because the hillsides were green, full of grasses, alive with life. If you've traveled through Palestine and modern-day Israel, it's desert. There are a few rains, and shortly after those few rains, there may be a little bit of green, but there isn't much. And so when shepherds go out, they may go out for days at a time in ancient Palestine because the job of the shepherd is to keep the sheep moving. If there's only a little bit of life around, you stay for a bit here, and then you've got to move on. And the shepherd knows where the next place is. The shepherd knows the few places where the sheep can water. And so it's about moving. But those few places where the sheep can water, the sheep will still come together from multiple flocks, mix in. And you still um, have the sheep knowing who, be, who they belong to and who they will follow. So the shepherd in ancient Palestine is essential. Sheep can survive without a shepherd, but they'll should survive better with one because they will be led to better food, better water, and will be cared for more completely. The whole of life becomes better. Let's also remember, though, that um, any metaphor we talk about when we talk about the nature of God is just that. It's a metaphor. There are limits. Um, this is not the definition of God. It's a metaphor. God is life. We are thinking about God. How do we capture some sense of what we're about? Because one of the realities is that if you are a shepherd, what's your source of income? It's your sheep. And there's only so much you get off the wool. What do you do with a sheep that you can't keep? They go to market. We don't want to think about that. And that's not the point of the story. The story isn't about that next place. The story and the image is always meant to be thought of as what it's like to come into the presence of a shepherd who is caring for you and loving you. And that's where we claim the image. The same would be true of the image and the metaphor used of the gate. There's limits to this. There's limits. And we need to often try to step into the thinker's mind and take a hold of the image that's there and what it's lending to us. Yes, ask the other questions. But as one asks the other questions, sometimes we stop and say, yeah, 
Those are good questions, and it's a good direction to go, but um, this is where I'm stopping, because that's going too far. Now, always remember there's a gray area. The gray area would be places where we might have disagreements, where we might have differences of thought and differences of opinion, and guess what? That's good. What that gate might look like? Yeah, maybe we should talk about it. Maybe we should think about who's allowed in, who's not allowed in. But let's, let's step into the passage and think about where the passage is going. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but by another way, is only a thief or a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for the shepherd. And the sheep know the shepherd's voice. The shepherd calls out each one by name and knows each one. And the sheep hear the shepherd's voice and follow. And when the shepherd has brought all of them out, the shepherd goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow because they know the shepherd's voice. They will not follow the stranger because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Now, a brief aside here. I don't understand that last sentence. Because this is the part of the parable that makes the most sense to me. It's the one where you sort of get that sense that we know the voice of the one we follow. We know that we're called to only follow that voice and that there are certain ways in and out. But John, being John, has the story lead into yet another story. And it's meant to sort of have a conversation. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate. All who come before me are thieves and bandits. But the sheep did not listen to their voice. I am the gate, and whoever enters by me will be saved and will be led to green pastures. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And this is a, that abundant word, I'm on another aside, that abundant word is very much about Jesus um, of John's gospel as being one that this, there's a way of entering into the living faith that really it's about life. There's always this overwhelming sense in John's gospel that when we enter into the way and when we enter into God's way that we will have an abundance around us and we will be led into living knowing, knowing that this is paradise and that there is so much for which to be thankful for. Well, the story continues. And now we get to the shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd, does not own the sheep, 
sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. The wolf comes and devours them and scatters the sheep. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. Now again, another side. I'm not sure I agree with that. This comparison with the hired hand, because I know people um, who are workers in businesses and helpers in businesses that often care more about the business than the owner. But maybe Jesus has a comparison in place that he wants us to be thinking about. Maybe we're allowed to question, just is this a good comparison, not a good comparison? Maybe that's the point. Part of what John wants us to always be doing is asking questions and thinking and not becoming too confident about any specific interpretation because we're supposed to think about who we are and what we're about and we're supposed to pull a piece from here and a piece from there and, and let them have conversations because it's not always black and white. And yet the messages often flow through. Jesus goes on, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. The Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for my sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. That's an interesting sentence. Think about that one. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. So there will be one flock and one shepherd, because they listen to my voice also. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it up from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up. I have received this command. From my father. So when Jesus actually starts to talk about himself as the, the shepherd and use that metaphor for his way of being, he will pull in the word good. It's one of the few times he will add in an adjective. Because what he wants us to be doing is not just thinking about all the possible interpretations and um, places that we're, we could run with this, he wants us to embrace that word good, the good qualities. There's also the question that as one looks at this particular passage, and particularly when he gets to the gate, is when is he talking about himself as the shepherd and you and I as the sheep? And when is it that we, you and I, are the shepherd. I think we're meant to step into this world also. That there's always this time where we're supposed to be thinking, how am I the sheep and also how am I the shepherd? And if I'm stepping into the realm of being the one who is the shepherd, it's embracing the good. So when we get to this differences of opinion about the owner versus the hired person, we're talking about the good shepherd. The thing I think we're supposed to start to realize is that the hired person can clock out. The hired person can go home. The hired person may be there only for a season and isn't concerned about next year or the year after. The shepherd is the one for whom this is 24-7. 365 times how, 10 years in a decade, times 10 decades in a century, until one's last breath. So part of what we're invited to step into 
is the sense of we're the shepherd, just as we're the sheep. Part of what we're called to step into is that we look at the good pic big picture and that we be ready to lay down our lives for those for whom we intersect. And the world is the sheep. That we're really ready to give our all. Not because we have to, but because we want to. It's because we are in relationship. We know each other's voice. We know each other's being because we're living together. All this is meant. And so when we look at a passage like this, this passage is very much about how do I look at Jesus as my shepherd and get comfort because he's ready to give all for us. I'm not going to the cross on this. I know that's part of where one is meant to go. But also what one needs to be aware of is that Jesus is living with people and very much simply saying, this is the nature of your God. That your God is with you. Your God is with you. And if you enter into that relationship you will be led to green pastures. Your cup will overflow. There will be abundance in life. The other hand, if you step into this, you are the shepherd. You are called to be in relationship with the world, ready to give your life for others. It's a both ends. Look at this passage, think about it, argue with it, argue with your pastor. Walk out saying, pastor, you are wrong because. And guess what? You're right. <laughs> and I will look at you and say, you're wrong because. And guess what? I'm right too. Sometimes we all can be right with different perspectives. I see the clock, and I knew I was going to talk too long. I'm sorry. I think we better head to the altar for prayer. And didn't Shirley do a nice job of bringing the sheep in? You know what's really good about this? Because she had sheep up here, I didn't make you pretend that you were sheep. <laughs> um, as we enter into a time of prayer, we think of of genocides of the past. We'll pause in a time of quiet, and then out of the quiet, I will share our prayer concerns. Let us pray. Bill and Carol Yerkes lift up a prayer for Ernie and Candy Woofter. Ernie is in the hospital, concerned that he may have liver cancer. They lift up prayers for Jim and Linda, both who are experiencing COVID. Joe is worried about his friend Sarah, who he hasn't heard from for a while, and whose daughter also hasn't heard from her. May she be safe, and may they receive word. He's also concerned about pain in his knee. Vonda is concerned about a nurse by the name of Scott Gessinger, a friend of hers.
and the concern is cancer. Loving God. And sometimes it's strange to talk to you and call you loving God when we're lifting up suffering and pain and heartache and some of the nasty side of life. And yet we know that you're a God who wants us to be whole and that you're present with us and that you're enfolding us with healing and with strength and with life and with energy. We ask that you bring healing to the Armenian community. We ask that you bring healing to each of these individuals that we lifted up. We ask that you help the lost to be found. That there be strength. That there be hope. We ask that you be with those individuals that we have not named, including ourselves for each of us has a different need. And hear us as we pray, as our shepherd taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we transition into thinking about offering, I always want to give thanks to you for the gifts you give to your church that helps to maintain this building, the lights, and the ministry, and all that we do. But I also want to draw attention to our dresser, because this is also how you give, and give (laughs) abundantly. A dresser for a new parent, full of items for a child in this world. And while we can't always solve the problems of the whole world. In fact, we practically never can solve all the problems of the world. We can bring joy and life into one person's life, into one home. And that's what this dresser represents, helping a child to live and to live life fully in a loving family. Thank you. And let us pray. Loving God. We ask that the child who receives benefit from these gifts, the family that receives benefit from these gifts, may know love, laughter, life, joy, fulfillment. Amen.
May you go forth into the world experiencing the comforting presence of the Good Shepherd. May you go forth into the world and be the Good Shepherd. And let us join our voices together in the commission. Our church will provide a place and direction for joining with God, healing the broken, and educating youth and adults. We are challenged by our faith to reach out to our congregants, our community, and world family, and to offer opportunities for spiritual growth and renewal. We welcome all into our Christian family. This is our mission as a church of Jesus Christ. And may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Amen.